Google knows what you want to search before you finish typing. Facebook can tag you automatically in a photograph. Heck, cars can drive themselves now. That's not just computers getting better, that's artificial intelligence getting smarter. Jeffrey Hinton's three decades of work on deep machine learning helped make it happen, and he joins us now on where AI is today and where it's headed. He's a professor of computer science at the University of Toronto and a distinguished researcher at Google, and it's great to have you here at TVO. It's great to be here. Want to just give us a basic definition of deep learning to start with? So your brain has more than 10 billion neurons in it. Even mine? Even yours. Okay. And the way it works is at each moment, each neuron has to decide whether to go ping. And it bases that decision on pings it gets from other neurons. And it weights those pings. So some pings it takes a lot of notice of. And these pings tell it either you should go ping or you shouldn't go ping. And it changes those weights. So by changing how much it listens to other neurons, a neuron can change how it behaves. And that's how you learn everything. So that just leaves one question, which is, what's the principle for changing how much you listen to other neurons? And that's called a learning algorithm. And deep learning is a learning algorithm for changing how much one neuron will rely on other neurons to decide whether to go ping. Do I assume there's a shallow learning as well? Oh, yes, there's shallow learning. That's what the other people do. And <laughs> okay. um, that doesn't have lots of layers of neurons between the input and output. So we're into deep learning here. How does deep learning mimic how humans learn about the world? Well, nobody really knows how in the real brain you change the strength of the connections that determine how much one neuron affects another neuron. Um, but in the 1980s, people came up with a very effective algorithm for doing that. And it's meant to be a simplified model of the brain. Um, nobody knows if the brain actually works like this. And back in the 80s, people were very suspicious because the algorithm didn't work that well. But as computers got faster and we got bigger data sets, this algorithm now works really well. It's used all over the place. It's used in your cell phone. Um, and so now it seems like a better bet for what the brain might be up to. You know who made it up, this algorithm? It was invented first in about 1970 by some obscure guy. Um, it was reinvented by lots of people. And then in the 80s, when computers were fast enough to implement it effectively, um, people started using it and showing what it could do. Hmm. But computers weren't fast enough to make it really impressive then. So mainstream AI didn't believe in this algorithm. What happened a few years ago was computers became fast enough, and suddenly this algorithm started solving all the problems that mainstream AI couldn't solve, hmm. like recognizing speech, for example. Would, uh, would Watson, the computer from Jeopardy, who beat everybody, would that be part of what we're talking about here? There's little bits of machine learning in Watson, and some of those bits may well use this algorithm, but mostly it's hand programming. It's a very impressive system, but it involves a huge amount of human labor to make it work. And the idea of these artificial neural networks is you'll try and learn everything. I suspect everybody knows who Watson is, but on the chance you don't, let's show a clip and remind everybody. Here's Watson from Jeopardy, who was awfully good. Roll the clip, please. Final frontiers for 1,000, Alex. Tickets aren't needed for this event, a black hole's boundary from which matter cannot escape. Watson. What is event horizon? Yes. Literary character, APB, for 200. Wanted for a 12-year crime spree of eating King Rothgar's warriors. Officer Beowulf has been assigned the case. Watson. Who is Grendel? Yes. Final frontiers for 200. It's Michelangelo's fresco on the wall of the Sistine Chapel, depicting the saved and the damned. Watson. What is the last judgment? Correct. You know, it's amazing either of the other two guys got anything right, but yeah. I did notice they had something there. Okay, again, let's go through this. How does the artificial intelligence in Watson compare to deep learning? So the main difference is in deep learning, you're trying to learn everything with nobody programming it. The only thing that gets programmed in your computer simulation is the learning algorithm. Huh. So everything they... inside this neural net gets learned from data, not programmed in by hand. So they're thinking. Um, yes, you could say that. I just did. Yes. Is that accurate, though? It's independent thought in some respects? You might irritate some philosophers, but yes, I think they are thinking. <laughs> uh, that's very heavy. All right, let's. Uh, uh, we got an example of this here. Shall we try this? Got my trusty um, device here. Okay. This is a Google Translate iPad program for the iPad, which apparently can translate 
Spanish to English. That's what it's programmed for right now. Sheldon, you want to get the camera on this and we'll try this? We've got here something that says hola, Spanish okay. for hello. Now let's see if this is it. We've, it's programmed into here. We're going to put this on top of, oh, and there it's happening already. Look at that. You put the camera above hola and it instantly translates over and over again to hello. Can you walk us through how the neural networks are in, first of all, what, what's a neural network? Because that's what's at play here, right? Okay, so a neural network is a simulation of a whole bunch of neurons, and it's something that learns by changing the connection strengths between neurons. And is so that what's happening here? So for recognizing the characters, it uses a neural net. And that neural net is trained on lots and lots of characters from lots of different fonts and with lots of different distortions and noise. And a neural net is currently the best system for being able to re reliably recognize characters that are deformed and noisy. Now, did this program just translate that because somebody made a code to consider every possible word in Spanish to translate? Or is this thing thinking? OK. For this particular program, I I think currently it's not using neural nets to do the translation. It's using neural nets to do the character recognition. Oh, OK. Um, but Google and other people already have neural nets doing translation. And they're doing translation. They're not being used online at present. Um, when you do Google Translate, it'll look at phrases in one language and translate them to phrases in the other language. And it has this huge table. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a new way of doing machine translation that's much more interesting that uses neural nets where it reads the sentence in one language and turns it into a thought. That is, when I say something, that expresses a thought. And obviously, the way to do translation is to figure out the thought being expressed in the first language and say the same thing in the second language. And Google now has translation systems that work like that. Um, they're about comparable with the existing translation system on a medium-sized training set. Hmm. They're not quite as good as the existing system on a really big data set yet, but they will be. And in a few years' time, we'll be doing machine translation by take the sentence in one language, turn it into a big pattern of neural activity that is the thought behind that sentence, and then say that thought in the other language. Can it understand nuance when it sees it? It understands some nuance. Mm -hmm. At present, it it's, can use a lot of improvements still. Um, so there's some things it can't do at present. Like, if I say to you in English, the trophy would not fit in the suitcase because it was too big, you know the it refers to the trophy because it wouldn't fit. Yes. But if I say the trophy would not fit in the suitcase because it was too small, you know the it refers to the suitcase. And that's real world knowledge affecting how you translate. Now, if you translate from English to French, in French you just can't say it. Mm -hmm. You have to choose a gender. Yes. And so we can't translate that English sentence into the French sentence yet. Because you need real world knowledge to decide what gender to make that it. Hmm. That will happen. I don't know if it'll happen in a few years or 10 years. But once that happens, we'll know that it's really understanding. And it can figure out homonyms uh, without oh, any difficulty? Stuff like that's no problem. That's easy It's stuff. the use of complicated real world knowledge huh. to disambiguate things. Huh. And it's beginning to be able to do it, but it can't do it properly yet. Is there one area in particular that you think deep learning is going to change the future? Um, no, I think it's going to change the future in lots and lots of areas. So let me give you a few examples. Yeah. Over the last few years, it's sort of become the method of choice for recognizing speech. Um, it's now becoming the method of choice for transcribing speech. So going all the way from the sound wave to a transcription of what's said with just one neural network that does everything. It's going to become the method of choice for machine translation. Um, Suppose you want to design a new drug. You'd like to know, um, I, I give you a bunch of candidate molecules, and you'd like to know how well they'll bind to some target site. And you'd like to predict that rather than doing the experiment, because it's much cheaper to do a prediction than an experiment. Mm -hmm. And then you only experiment on the ones that are predicted to work well. And neural nets recently became the best method of doing that. Um, if you want to identify a pedestrian in the road, a neural net's definitely the best method of doing that. So. It's all over. These, hmm. these neural nets, especially the ones um, using these deep learning algorithms, 
are going to be used everywhere. How many years away do you think we are from a neural network being able to do anything that a brain can do? I don't know. It's very hard to predict the future beyond five years. I don't think it'll happen in the next five years. Beyond that, it's all a kind of fog, so I'd be very cautious about making a prediction. Is there anything about this that makes you nervous? Um, in the very long run, yes. I mean, obviously, having other super intelligent beings who are more intelligent than us is something to be nervous about. It's not going to happen for a long time, but it is something to be nervous about in the long run. What aspect of it makes you nervous? Well, will they be nice to us? It's just like the movies. You're worried about that scenario in the movies. In where the they, very long term, yes. Where they I think over the next five or ten years, we don't have to worry about it. Um, also, the movies always portray it um, as an individual intelligence. I think it may be that it goes in a different direction where we sort of develop jointly with these things. So the things aren't fully autonomous. They're developed to help us. They're like personal assistants. And we'll develop with them. And it'll be more of a symbiosis than a rivalry. But we don't know. Is that an expectation or a hope? That's a hope. That sounds like more a hope yeah. than an expectation. Let me read this here. This is uh, from a piece in the Daily Beast last December by G. Clay Whitaker, talking about uh, the year AI took the wheel. Artificial intelligence did more than look at algorithms this year. And while we've heard about supercomputers and quantum computing for years, this is the first time that any of that lightning fast, thinking out an answer text started sharing the roads, the roofs, and the responsibilities with you and me. And people are split over whether that was a good thing. Uh, I do want to pursue this, uh, you know, this notion of expectation versus hope. You hope it'll all work out well. But in the long run, I, I sense uh, your expectation may not be quite as benign. Is that fair to say? I think it's very, very hard to know what will happen beyond a five-year horizon. So I, my, my state of mind is I just don't know what's going to happen. Um, I think trying to stop the technology would be very hard. I mean, if you look at automatic teller machines, my guess is back when they were introduced, people complained about them putting bank tellers out of work. Hmm. But I think nobody now would say they were a bad idea. Even bank tellers? Even bank tellers. Hmm. I mean, their jobs are more interesting because they deal with the tricky cases rather than you just wanted to take $20 out. Right. Um, right. So it's clear that that technology is a force for good. Um, whether a technology is a force for good or for bad depends a lot on the political system and what the political system decides to do with it. That's what I wanted to follow up on, because clearly things, things in so many different areas of life are changing so quickly, faster than our political systems are designed to make rules and laws around them. Uh, so how deeply involved do you think politics has to be, or governments have to be, in order to um, deal with the changes that are coming in this sector? They're going to have to be involved. So if you just take driverless cars, it's pretty clear to everybody in the industry, I think, that driverless cars will save a whole lot of lives. But the politicians are terrified of the first time a driverless car runs somebody down. Mm -hmm. um, so politically, if a driverless cars kill a few people, but save tens of thousands of people, that's a problem for the politicians. But they should just face up to it and say, look, these things are going to make us much safer. It'll take a brave politician to say, I know two people were killed but here's the 10,000 we saved. You can't see the 10,000 saved, you can certainly see the two killed. Yeah, so and gonna there's going to be a lot of that, but it's, it's very clear that driverless cars hmm. are going to be a good thing. Hmm. Uh, okay, so in conclusion, what kind of impact do you hope deep learning has on our future? I hope that it, for example, allows Google to read documents and understand what they say, and so return much better search results to you. So you can search by the content of the document rather than by the words in the document. I hope it'll make for intelligent personal assistants who um, can answer questions in a sensible way and have a sensible conversation as opposed to a conversation that keeps getting derailed. Mm -hmm. um, it'll give us driverless cars. That's clearly going to come fairly soon. It'll make computers much easier to use, I think, because you'll be able to just say to your computer, how do I print this damn thing? And the computer <laughs> will do it, rather than you have to figure out all these commands. So it should make, if you're right, it should make our lives better. Yes, it should be just like automatic teller machines that we should make that little bit of life better, but it should do that mm. for a lot of things. Fingers crossed. Yes. Jeffrey Hinton, it's good of you to join us at TVO tonight. Thanks so much. Thank you. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.